The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. So recap, we'll, yesterday we talked a little bit about similar topics and we talked a little about the first interaction into Swift. And uh, so basic into Swift, that is not really, it looks like a program, uh, scripting language, but it isn't. It's very static, it's very type safe, it has a, a lot of like similarities to C++ and other applications. Uh, and we talked about two types of variables. Can somebody remember what they were? What are the difference? Yeah, let and var, these are the two types. What is let? What does let mean? Exactly, and var is then, is then a variable, exactly. So, let constants and var is a variable. So, um, and we talked a little bit about the basics of Xcode. We should, uh, Philip showed you how you can use it, Xcode, and I will continue on that and show you a little bit about the debugging. So, we talked about the IB outlets and the IB actions, which you will use a lot in your first applications because that's the, the bridge between the interface builder, so the graphical programming or the graphical design of your application and the connection to your code way. So can you, can somebody remember what an IB outlet was? Which direction? Connect the UI. Yeah, what, in which direction? What does the IB outlet do? So you have the interface here and you have the code here. What does the IB outlet do? What does the IB outlet allow you to do? The one way could be that the, the interface triggers something in the code and, yeah, and the, from the other way the code can access information from the interface. So what's the outlet? It's the connection between the, the, those UI component and... Uh... Yeah. So basically the, the easier one is the action because the action is basically saying you press a button in the interface and it triggers a function in your code. So the action is the connection from the interface to the code. So there's a functionality out there. And the outlet is the other way around. So for example, if you have a text label and you want to change that label, you have to get access to that label somehow. And this is the outlet where you can actually call in the code the outlet parameter and say, okay, change the text to, to a certain string. And this is um, the result of this. So what I want to do, what we didn't ma manage to get is to talk a little bit about debugging. And I will show you a little bit uh, about Xcode. So it's basically, uh, follow-up that we made yesterday. So I'm switching then to my Xcode and uh, I have the simulator here. So what I will do, I have just a simple application here. It's uh, the Sprite Kick game that Philip showed you already. So what it does, it shows this Hello World thing and every time I click, it creates these little round thing. I hope, can you see that in the back? The contrast is really, really bad. Can you see that, what I'm doing here? So it's basically have some circles that's all it does at the location where I am. So um, here's the code. So basically, this is our main scene that does basically the touch interaction. And what you can already see here in this, uh, let's figure it out, I always forget it, is, so these are some information that you get while you're running an application here. As you can see here, this is the, uh, the CPU usage. So what happens here, currently I'm not doing a lot in a graphical interface, so the CPU is not really triggered. But if I start clicking here something, the CPU usage gets high because there is some graphics involved, so you can actually live see what's going on on the system. This is currently on a simulator, so the simulator is way slower than the device itself because it emulates the entire environment. So if you have an application that runs really, really bad on a simulator, that does not mean anything to your device. But you can actually do that the same thing on the device. So you have your device connected and you get the same information as well. You can also check uh, memory management, uh, so what's going on here, for example, if I allocate something, it will go up. So if I create objects, a lot of them, you will see that. Uh, you will get the disk usage, so what happens to your storage if you do a lot of reading and writing applications. And you get also network information, for example, if you would have an application that, that uses the network of the device, you will see the network stack and everything going on. So this is basically live information. You have a lot of more information down here, which goes into detail. Uh, information. You also have, when you run it on your device, you get an energy consumption environment. Here you don't get anything because the simulator cannot work with that, but on the device itself you can actually see what kind of parts of your code runs most, uh, takes most of the energy. In this case it would be if I click here this, this thing, this would take most of the energy because it is a rendering thing that uses the GPU and takes some computational power 
to run this. So you will see a uh, spike. All right, thank you. Uh, you will see a spike in, um, in your energy consumption. So this is basically life information. Um, and what you can do now is the typical approach like doing breakpoints and checking out what's going on in the code here. And uh, let me find a function here. So um, touch began is the typical function that basically what it does, what it said, is it's triggered when I create a touch point. So what I can do is I create a, a breakpoint here, and then I can uh, just do a touch point, and this breakpoint is set. So what you get here now, the application is stopped at this position, and I can go, can check out what it is. You cannot, unfortunately, this is small. I cannot enlarge this, but, but you can see, uh, inspect the objects that are currently relevant. For example, I can check, okay, what's the label here? So I can have the, the current status of the label. So this is currently an SK label, which is in the SpriteKit application a label. And you can have a look at it and um, see, okay, it's a node and has a lot of parameters. So you can see live while the system is working that you have a lot of parameters. What you can also do is you can um, you know, probe into your code by using a special command called PO. So for example, I could say, okay, give me PO label. Uh, it gives you also completion as well. So you can check about the current state of the label. So you can even uh, look in the scope that where you currently are, what's going on. So in this case, the label has, has the name hello label, which we already said. It has the text hello world. It has a certain font type, and it has currently a position zero, zero, because we didn't give it a position. But I can also ask a little bit more. I can say, okay, self, uh, self is currently the scene, which contains uh, um, uh, let's see what's coming there. So self is currently this, this scene, which we created to get some information about the, the frame, how large it is, but you can also ask something, for example, uh, in this case we have a, a set of touches or an event, and I can ask the event how many touches are in this event. So I can ask here, event, uh, I think it's all touches, yeah, and currently has the information about the current touch that I created with a lot of detailed information. The, the pointer, which face the touch is, uh, how many force is currently applied. So you, on the iPhone, you can actually have force. In this case, it's always zero because the simulator cannot work with force. And a lot of different information about where it is and which window it is, so you cannot get a lot of detailed information. But you can also ask something like, for example, uh, self node at location. Uh, let me see if I can. Oh, this does not have an auto completion. Oh, it does. So I can basically trigger functions. Oh. oh, yeah. So basically, I, I'm now calling the scene and asking, okay, do you have a certain node at a certain location? So I'm asking the system, basically, I'm, I'm triggering a function from, from the node itself, uh, or from the uh, function itself, which is currently not run, but I can use it because I'm currently in that time frame. Where well, the system is just stopped and I can query certain information. You can actually call also information on all of these things. So, and basically, and then you can click on this thing and then basically continues working. So you can continue working, for example, when you want to set a debug function, all of these things. You can also modify these things. When I say, let's do that again, where was it? Yeah. Uh, edit breakpoint and I can set some uh, some parameters. For example, I can have a condition, something, when I would define a variable, say this, this variable, this, Breakpoint should only be triggered when I have my mouth above a certain level or something. I can say, okay, it should be um, should be triggered only the third time when I when I run through that function. This is very helpful if you have a function that runs a lot of times and you can actually have these things. See if it works. So first time, second time, third time. So it triggers only then when I define these conditions. But I can also step through the code by using these buttons here. So I can basically step to the code in both directions, and I can step over functions, so the typical debug function that you probably know from other applications. Okay, this is the simple debugging now for, for uh, graphical applications. You have this uh, more advanced mode where I can actually look into the graphical stack itself. So you can have a look what's currently rendered, which windows are currently displaced somewhere. And here you can see, uh, I'll make it a little bit bigger, 
So the main thing here is that we have a UI view. The UI view is the main thing that you see. So it's a window, basically. And on top of this, there's my controller that runs my application. And in this controller, there's a certain view, in this case, that is rendered on top of that. And in this view, I have a lot of different options. As you can see, so can you see that this is currently highlighted? So I actually can step through the graphical application and see what is what at which level. So I can see the hierarchy of my graphical tool. This works very well with most. I think, I'm not sure, does it work with metal? I guess not. <laughs> yeah, so um, usually it works for when you do a normal application. So you can actually see if you have multiple uh, views on top of each other. You can actually see these different layers. Um, it works for SpriteKit and SceneKit as well, but I'm not sure with Metal because it's very, very close to the hardware, so I'm not sure if it can debug. What, what was able with OpenGL that you can actually see these OpenGL stacks and calls which are currently are active, so there is something relevant, maybe similar to Metal. I cannot try it because it doesn't run on the system. And yeah, so this gives you a lot of like powerful insights where you can debug and see actually why I'm not seeing an object or what's the current state of these things. And we will, in a, in a similar topic about debugging, we will, the, the group will go in more detail and show you a little bit more in detail and show you a much more powerful tool like instruments that you can actually do a lot more analysis about these things. But this already gives you the first impressions or the first hints where your application has some problems and all of these things. So, okay, uh, let's continue with uh, Swift programming. And um, where's the clicker? Oh, it doesn't matter. So, um, the first thing we talk about uh, today is a little bit about strings. And strings are very often used, and you will use them a lot. String is the, one of the most common types that you have. And I'm going to quickly go over that. If you have any questions, please ask. But I assume most of the stuff you should already know from Java and other things. So strings is a Unicode thing. You can have this de declaration, what we already seen here. And you have the typical function that you have. You have the count that gives you the number of characters. Um, you can actually um, have, you have another type, which is called character. And it represents just one character. So it's a string is a, it's a sequence of characters. And uh, the character type is basically just one character. However, if you create just this one, you could think about, OK, doing to type inference. The compiler says, okay, this is just one character, so I use the type character, but this is not the case. Because the system assumes you mostly use, use strings, because why should you? I mean, a string is very short and doesn't really cost a lot of uh, computing power, so it always assumes that every time you do these, these uh, things, it is a st string and sector character. So if you want to have, for some reason, if you need a character for some application, you always have to cast it directly because otherwise it will be always a string. You can convert between these two with a convert function, but it always assumes that you use strings. So um, yeah, strings can be empty, not nil. If you want to have a nil option, you need to use the optional. But um, if you want to have a string that is empty, it's basically there's nothing in there, and you here can, have, can check for if, if it's empty, then you get the empty equation. Uh, Concatenation is also possible with strings. So you have like uh, the typical string one and string two, hello world. There are multiple ways to do that. You can actually say, okay, I want to have string one plus string two and create a new string of that. So you concatenate them. You can use um, normal, a string variable and just a string to concatenate them. And you can do this, this plus equal operation that you probably already know. However, this only works on var vars because the let would not allow you to modify the value of these objects. Um, and this is already what, what Philip showed you yesterday. If you want to have like a print statement or want to have a combination of multiple strings and variables in together, you use this, this notation of the, of the slash and then the brackets and you put a variable in there. So in this case, you're basically transforming the, the variable into a string with this type. And what, what will be there, that is basically the variable thing. So um, what you will figure out that you if you use this one, you use that a lot. The compiler at some point say, OK, this is not optimized. So you have like, I don't know, five or six of these plus operations together. The, op the compiler will say, this is too complex because it could be made easier. And then you should use, use this notation because then the compiler can work with that a little bit better. Uh, I'm not sure at which point it breaks down, but five to six times. And then it usually says, do not do it. A concatenation. 
Yeah, yeah, at some point it says it's too much. Because it's not that optimized. So, uh, quality in comparison, so if you have the typical operations, if you have uh, comparison objects, you have month and other months like January with a big J, it is uh, the comparison, the equal sign is basically compares between these things. And if you have a lowercase version, so it actually checks for lowercase and uppercase operations, but there are also these, these operations where you can cast this saying, okay, I want to have a lowercase and an uppercase environment. Um, the interesting thing about strings, if you would ever work with, um, with pointers, that is actually one string. If you have two strings, if you create a string January and other months in this case, they point to the same reference in the memory management. They are basically because it's optimization of the system, because in this case, a let, you cannot modify it anyways. So why should it use more space? So this is an optimization process that you see that strings are usually, when they are, have the same type or when they have the same value or something, the string is the same, it is actually the same memory management because strings are highly optimized on the system to reduce memory space. Uh, however, for this is usually something that we had in Objective-C a lot of fun with because if you create these things and compare this and you found they are the same but because they didn't have any connection. But in Swift you don't have that problem that much. Um, yeah, and I said already you have these, these lowercase operators, you have uppercase operators, you have camel case operators. So if you just type in a string and look at the functionalities of a string, there are hundreds of different methods that you can apply for a string. So substring, you get like the first characters, the last characters, you find something in a range there. Filter options where you can look for a certain character and remove it, or you can ad advance these things. So strings are very powerful, and they have a lot of uh, functions that you can check out in the documentation, and you will probably use them well. Okay, moving on to, to functions, which is one of the most frequently used operation that you see. And a function is, is pretty straightforward. You have... Um, usually have this keyword func at the beginning of your function, then you have a function name, and then you have a parameter, and then you can define a return value. Uh, you don't have to, if you have a void function, you can just get rid of the return value, so just leave it out. If you don't have any parameter, you can use, like this here, just the brackets, and it indicates, okay, this is a function which does not take any parameter and doesn't want to have a return value. In this case, we just use the print value, and you just can call the function by using this display pi with the brackets, and then you're fine to go. So nothing fancy there. So if you have a function with, uh, with one parameter, you have to define it in a certain way. So you put it into records, and in this case, you have to define either the, na the name of the variable, and you have to define the type. Because the Swift is type safe, so you have to define which type is that parameter. The first one is basically, and in this case, we define a value, and it's an integer and then you define this in a way and then you can use it and uh, call it in the same way by saying, okay, this is my function, this, should, this is the value parameter, and it should be 10. Uh, similar to that, you can also have multiply, multiple of them by just adding a comma in between and you write the same thing. So first number is the name of that variable, this is the type, second number is the name of second variable, and this is the type, and then you can use it in the same way. And then you can call it. You can imagine this can get really, really long if you have multiple parameters, if you have longer names. So um, there are some ways to reduce that by using another keyword that can say, okay, what should be the name from when I call the function and what should be the name of the variable when I use it in the function? So you can actually have two separate names, which is in some cases very useful. First of all, you can reduce the size of the function call don't have that function call, but have clear names inside the function. In this case, it's uh, say hello to person. So this, the two is basically the name from the outside, if you want to call that function. And the person is uh, um, the name of the variable inside that function. And here again, uh, and another person. And inside the function, we'd use the person as reference to that variable. And, in, um, and the, from the outside, you can just call that to to make it easier, to make, give you a little bit more access to that. You can also say, okay, I don't want to have that. I just want to call the, the parameters in a, in a sequence by separated by commas. And you can indicate by using this, this underscore in front of a variable. So instead of giving in the name, you say, oh, I, I don't care about the name. I'm, yet, I'm just using these notations. And then you can have like the typical parameters without any specific name. So um, 
What you can also do is you can define uh, variable uh, functions which have some kind of default value. In this case, for example, we have a team name and we want to have a score in there. I mean, I'm not always want to use that score because it could be zero at the beginning. I don't want to have always calling this function. And here I can say, okay, the score is an integer and should have, if I don't call it, should have the, zero, the value zero. So now I have two choices how I can call this, this function by saying, I will just want to have my WOMADs and they should have a score, or I don't care about the score right now, I just want to use um, the, the default value and then just can call this. So the compiler then checks for these things and defines these values. Otherwise, if you don't define this thing, you always have to call every parameter, otherwise the system will say this function doesn't exist. Um, okay, these are parameters, let's talk a little bit about return values. Uh, return values are uh, do not really have a name here, but they have just a type. So the first part is already familiar, the second part now will return an integer, and we basically say, uh, yeah, it should return an integer, and you return a value by using this return keyword, and then you put a parameter in here. And whatever you return, you have to define it at the beginning of this thing. Um, and you can call this in the same way, and this returns in this definition. Um, here in this case, you can also put a tuple in there, for example, if you want to use tuple operations, then this allows you to return as much as variables if you define, because you can dynamically create a tuple, and this gets away around these typical things that normal functions do not really allow return you then more than one value. In other languages, you would have to define a dictionary or an array in this case. However, in Swift, you can easily just create a tuple and define these things in a, in a simple way, and this allows you then to, to work with this. So, um, as I already said yesterday, structs are a very strong concept in Swift, and actually we've seen already a lot of structs here. Um, structs, for example, a string is a struct, an integer, a double, a boolean, these are all structs uh, construct from, the, from the conceptual model. And structs are uh, value types, so anybody knows the difference between value type and reference type, I hope? Is that clear? Or should I explain it? Okay, let's assume this. Just one word, so value types, basically every time you call them, you get a copy of them, and you have a reference type every time you call them, you get the, the pointer to that object. So basically, this is the difference between the struct and the class. So the basic struct is also uses this keyword, and you can, inside this, this struct, you have this person, and it has a, a variable, a name, and a string. So this is the definition of the struct. And you can easily create it by saying, okay, I create this struct with the name person, and then I can, if I want to uh, call that variable, I put the dot in between these, these points, and then now I can use the struct in the same way. Um, but also, I can create functions, and this is actually not very common among languages, that you can actually have a struct which also has a function inside. So, for example, if you think about Objective-C, it doesn't allow you to do that. C++ is a little bit strange on this one. But uh, typical uh, structs do not have functions, but Swift introduced it, so this makes a lot of sense to in use this. So here, the same way as you would do it in a class, you would also define this function in here, and then you can do it in the same way by saying, okay, this is my person here I just created, and I'm calling this function with a bracket case as I already showed you in this case. Um, as you have also um, um, struct, Struct, um, functions you have also initializes how you create an object, how you create a structure. We already seen here, for example, if you want to initialize uh, a string, an integer, a boolean, which are structs in a way, you use the init function, or you can just type the values that you already see. So this basically calls a certain type, it's a, it's a short version of calling string init and then with a certain value, for example. But if you would just do that, you get these default uh, creator um, things. Um, uh, there are these default constructs if you, you don't have to create them, as you've already seen here. So in this case, I can just use this one. Um, this creates the default value. If I set one, if I don't set one, this will not work. So you will always have to check. Otherwise, this will say, okay, I have no idea what the value should be, so I'm not doing anything. I think, I hope. Otherwise, maybe it calls this, in, this, this init function from this, and this is something that you can try out. Um, and here, if I set the value, I can use this one. But you can also define certain in initializers that you would, that you want to do. For example, if you have a temperature con converter and you say, okay, I want to have something we initialize with Celsius and something with Fahrenheit, I can just create the initializers here, 
that do automatically the calculation, so I save one variable in here. So this is the typical thing that you've probably seen from, um, from classes as well. Okay, and then you could call this in this way. However, typically a struct is, is, is a fixed set. You cannot really modify that, so it's not, not designed to actually adapt that. And if you want to do that, for example, you have, you have a struct of a person and an age, and you want to change that, or in this case, the odometer, and check the count, you have to define that in your function that this function should actually modify a value or a variable inside your, your struct. And you use this by doing this, this um, by adding this mutating function on this one. If you don't use that, a function could not edit the value inside this thing. If it's once, once set, you cannot actually change it, even if it's a var or not. You will not be able to do that if you don't use the modify function. So in this case, we create this thing, we just do a, um, create a um, count from zero, and then we increment it by 15, and then we reset it. So here you can actually choose these things. So if you want to have run into issues where you want to modify these things, don't forget the mutating function call. Um, there's also something called computing properties, which are very useful, which we'll see later on when you think about extensions. But here, it's basically, uh, at some point, you want to save memory space, you want to have a struct which is very small, for example, this temperature thing, and you don't want to have a variable for Celsius, for Fahrenheit, or for, for, for Kelvin, but you can just, just ca calculate it on the fly. And you can actually do that by saying, okay, um, I'm defining a variable, uh, Fahrenheit in this case, this should be a double, but this is not a fixed variable, but I put it into this, this brackets and say, okay, this should be just computed when I call this function. So this value doesn't really exist unless you call it. So it's computed on the fly when you just apply this. However, if this, this computation is complicated and you would call it like a lot of times, you will see, okay, yeah, if I call a, lot, a complex thing, you have to think about, okay, this will cost time. And then is the, the thing, should I save this, this information in a variable or should it do it in computational variable? So this is always like a trade-off between these two. But for most things, uh, it's quite easy to do that and it helps you to store the thing. Yes? Uh, why didn't they approach it as a functions rather than just a... Like you could also do it as functions. So, uh, so, so but different is only how you call it, right? Yes. The it's dot, the name, and the dot name with the yeah. Right. In this case, you could also say, okay, this is a function. This is a function here. Put a function here, and it doesn't really have a parameter and just returns a double. So the function would be very similar for this really, really ex simple example. But and which one is the best practice? I'd really, it doesn't. <laughs> it's hard to say. It really depends on what you want to do and what you want to define. For example. From the conceptual wise, it would make sense to have. Well, you can for temperature, you can do it either way. You could say, okay, there's a function of that class. It's totally up to you. At the end, it doesn't really matter, because it runs both systems in a simple way. It's just the way. If you think about this, okay, I want to have it in a variable because I have already these variables here, and I want, want to define additional ones. And this actually gets interesting later on when we talk about a lot of other concepts here, where you. Uh, extend these things, which we'll talk about later. But essentially, from com computation-wise, it doesn't really matter. If you, do, if you do a complex computation in a function or in a... This is basically a function. This is basically a different way how we call a function. So that's totally up to you when you, when you want to design these things, when you want to offer... I mean, the, the, you, you save the programmer two brackets at some point, but that, not really that important. Uh, but in some situation, it makes maybe more sense to use them than the other one. Yes? Do we have access modifiers for the uh, like public, private? Uh... Yes, a little bit. We talk about this later, but this exists in a certain way. And there's public protected and different levels of this where you can actually say it should be only in the class, should be only public accessible and all of these things. So these things exist, uh, but we will come to that later on. Um, and what you actually can do, you can also define uh, property observers. So, for example, um, when you want to see, okay, I want to have when the value is changed to something, I want to do something before that, or I want to do something afterwards. For example, if somebody set uh, the step counter to zero, uh, I should present a warning, okay, this was resetted or something like that, or I want to have like a value that I add to these things. So you can actually uh, create this variable 
and you can actually create these observers which will be triggered when you change the variable in this case. Um, so will set is something that will call, would, which is called uh, before you actually set the value. So the value is coming in as new value and it will, will allow you to do something before the value is actually set in that struct. And um, the did set is something that it does afterwards. So when your value is set and you have this keyword old value, you have the value which, is, which was before in that variable and you can do something with that, maybe do a notification and all of these things in a way. So let's talk a little bit about classes. Uh, classes are reference type, as I already said, and they work exactly the same way as structs, except that you have a pointer and don't get to copy if, the, if you use that. That's the only difference for now. But you do it in the same way. Um, you have to have, you, you create an initializer. Uh, I think you have to create an initializer for a class. If you don't want to do the basic initializer. Yeah, you, so you have to do initializer, so it's a little bit more work. Uh, but you can use the functions already, you can suit all the parameters or the things that I showed you before work as well as the classes as instructs. Um, you get the automatic one? Yeah, the automatic one, but it does not set the value. So, so, but it then will probably call the, the basic initializer of your variables if they have one. Yeah. Now, in, in struct, you have for every um, value that you have, that is the basic one that um, Counts for free. Yeah. If you do a new one, you have to yeah. list everything in the class. You have to do. Okay. Uh, the difference between structs and, and, and classes is that you can't do subclassing. So, the typical approach they want to have uh, in this case, okay, the student is a subclass of person, so uh, do it with this notation, and, and then you can override certain functions. Um, if you actually want to override a function, you have to indicate that by saying, okay, this is override, this should override this function here. If you don't add it, don't add the compiler will complain, okay, this function already exists in my, my parent class. Uh, if you want to override it, use the override statement. And then you can always uh, initialize that. However, it's a little bit, this is notation changes between different languages, but in this case, you, what you have to do in, in Swift, you have to, if you have a variable in the subclass, you have to set all the variables before you can actually initialize the superclass in this case. For example, an object C is actually the other way around. You have to first initialize the superclass and then the subclass. But in this case, you always have to set, okay, if I have my variable here, this has to be set before I can actually call the initializer of my, my superclass. This is just a notation to make sure. However, if you have like default values in here saying something like that, you wouldn't have to do that because it would then assume it will use the default initializer for that. But in this case, you have to call that. Otherwise, again, the compiler will complain and ask you to initialize these things uh, before you actually run these things. The nice thing about Xcode is all these basic values, it will immediately tell you, as you see in yesterday from Philip's presentation, Xcode starts complaining a lot, uh, really fast, uh, especially, it also creates errors, stuff like these things, and, and warnings, uh, as Philip already said, uh, errors you have to fix before you can compile warnings, yeah, you maybe not, uh, but maybe your system crashes. So, um, and actually the system will not allow you to compile when you have an error in there. So, so these are classes and structs. Let's talk a little bit about collections. Uh, collections are the typical common ones, are arrays, dictionaries, but they are more, they are maps, um, sets, and all of these things that you probably know from different classes. Um, so array is pretty simple. Uh, you have just an array, you can define it by saying with these, these uh, square brackets and say this should be a string array and it should contain these values. So this is a simple initializer. You can also do multiple initializers by this, but this is the simplest way. And it stores a string. However, the interesting thing is you can have just variables. You have an array is always from one specific type. So not like in Objective-C or something, you can say you have a super type and then you can add a lot of variables in there. There is also something like the any class, which you could put in here, so it could take any object that you like. However, then you would have to, every time you use it, you have to cast it to something and figure out what it actually is. So, should not do that, because it's getting messy. Um, however, this is the simplest one, and a dictionary is basically a lookup table. So you have a key, uh, and you have a value for that. So, for example, you can say, okay, Richard, and you can set this by putting an enter there and uh, putting the value in so. So you can ask the dictionary, so what is the value of your key? In this case, Richard, and you will return a uh, value. 
However, you have to define what is the, the key and what is the value type. In this case, this is automatically done because these are all integer, integers, but you could, could define it in a similar way by putting a string here and then uh, points in there and then your different variables. So you have to have like uh, the key value and um, the actual value needs to have a certain type. You can have the same type, but you can use any types for both of them in the same way. Um, however, one thing that is very, very different from a lot of other classes, uh, for other languages, these types are value types. So these are not references to something. So if you have an array and you create a new version of an array and you change something in the one array, it will not change in the other one. This is a concept which took me a long time to figure out because I'm used to from, from C and Objective-C to, to pass around arrays around the system and make sure the array is always the same. Does not work here. So what every time you, you create a new variable or you, you pass around an array, it's a copied version. Um, it's also true for a dictionary and basically for almost any other set that's out there. There are some sets which are a little bit more advanced which allow you to do that. But this is something that I struggled with coming from C++ and from other languages. But uh, I think in Java it's also a reference type. So yeah, have a lot of fun with that to figure out what's going on. So um, that's something that you should keep in mind. Um, as I already said, so initializers are uh, very simple. You can just do the notation that I just showed you. You can also do the old so the Swift, I think, 2.0 or 1.0 initializer, where you say, okay, array, and then with these brackets in int, but it's actually the same thing, or you could just say, I'm initializing this thing. Um, there are some, some more advanced functions. For example, I want to have uh, an array which should be filled. I don't have to create a for loop. I can use this notation by saying, okay, I want to have just an array full of, one, of zeros, which I can use that 400 times and should be in there. Calling an array, uh, also, very simple, you just use this notation and then you can um, get something out of there. Or want to set a different value here, um, you just use the bracket notation. However, you cannot change the value of an array when it's a let, because it's also constant and you, you ha always have to make sure that it's a var in this case. And you can add values by using the append operator that, that puts it basically at the end. You can also exchange parts in the middle and stuff, so there are a lot of functionalities like strings, uh, hundreds of different functions that you can call on array. Dictionaries are very similar. As I already said, you have to define, uh, first of all, the types, so the key type and the value type that you have. In this case, it's string and the integer and basically the same notation. And here I can actually um, search for Oli here in this case. Um, however, um, Oh, Ollie's not in there. Nice. So it should be, let's say, it's in there, and I can uh, call this, and I get the certain value. Okay, interesting slide. Um, and if I want to change something, I can use this, uh, for example, uh, scores, uh, update value for this particular key, and uh, then it changes this value inside this thing. Um, you can also uh, convert between these things, saying, okay, I want to have all the keys in my my dictionary and I want to have all the, the values in my dictionary that basically allows you to things. However, this is not deterministic because a, a dictionary is a map. So it maps a value, a key to a value. So the transformation between an array and a dictionary does not always have the same order. So in this case, it could be that the keys could be something that Lucas first and stuff and the other way around, because that's the typical situation when you have a set which is not ordered, so the data structure of an ordered system is usually bigger than an unordered one because you don't have a hash key. Um, so here you have to, if you want to have an order, there are ways to order these things, but then you have to call different functionalities. But the simplest one is basically saying, um, um, saying, okay, this should be uh, this thing. Um, when you want to check, it could be that, in this case, it could be, uh, let's say, okay, I have, uh, ah, let's search for Oli because we, it's not in there. But if I want to have, uh, ask my array, uh, or my, ask my dictionary for, for a certain value, but the key doesn't exist, like, like, uh, yeah, like Luke does exist, but it could be, I could put any string in there. And if you want to check that, you can use this, this if condition. Basically what it does, it creates this constant, my score, and it searches for this thing, and this is only true if this exists. 
So if look is in a dictionary, this will exist. Otherwise, the if statement is just false and it will go over to that. So basically, what you're doing here, you do an if, stand, if statement and create a constant at the same time. This is a typical concept that we see a lot of times in Swift, how you can actually ask for a certain value if it exists or not in this case. So um, let's talk about a little bit loop, uh, for loops. Yeah, you should know that. But the typical way how you define this is basically by saying by for a certain index in a certain value range. And you do that with the dot, dot, dot operator, and then it will iterate over these things. Uh, you can do uh, also say, I don't care about the value. I don't need that index, because I just want to have it run three times. So I can use the underscore operation again and say, I just print three times hello world. So if you don't need that, if you just want to have an iteration, you can optimize that. And actually, the compiler will give you uh, will give you like a hint saying, yeah, you actually don't use the index function. Maybe get rid of it to save a little bit of memory. Uh, this thing. Um, you can also iterate about about these collections. For example, um, in this case, I could say I want to iterate over the um, my array here, which is consists of three strings. I can call for name in names, and what it does automatically, the name already has a type inside your your value here. So it will be a string in this case. And I can just simply use that. Um, I can also iterate over the already existing string here, saying, OK, I want to have ABC and I want to have characters. What this function is actually doing, it transfers this string into, a, um, into an array of characters. So you have this, and then you can actually run through the entire operation. So and I can also say, if I want to have an index of this one, usually what you, you would do, you would define, OK, variable index, and you count it up as you see, because currently I don't have an index here. But you can do that by using, by using this tuple here. This is a tuple construction that says, OK, I'm using characters and using the enumeration option. So basically, it creates the index for yourself. And then you can say, OK, I want to have the index, which will count from 0 to the number of elements in your array. And I want to have actually the value of this thing. So this is a nice example where tuples are actually pretty useful. Because you're creating, you don't have to think about, OK, I'm creating a variable, and it will automatically increase the variable every time the loop runs through. And the last one is basically um, the same thing here for, for uh, dictionaries. Also, the same constructions. What you would usually do is, if you have a dictionary, you would have, uh, every time you call it, you would have to ask, OK, for, give me the value of that for that specific key. But here again, you can use the tuple construction by basically saying, OK, this is the value name. This is the, the weird count. And I basically can access them directly. I can also use the underscore operation if I don't care about these things. But it, it allows you to do that in a nice, uh, simpler way. And it, it optimizes a little bit more so you get a tiny fraction of performance there uh, if you use this notation instead of creating a new variable and adding it up by yourself. Um, so these are basically convenience functions. So. Uh, Basic while loop is also yeah nothing fancy here. It's the same way uh, as you would do it in in in, um, in any other language. You have a while loop, you have a condition there, and you can just uh, while use this. And you have, can also, if you want to break a loop, you can use the keyword break at some point when you run through the things. This also works with for loop. You can break every loop basically by using the break command, and then you basically breaking these operations. So um, this was the first introduction into basically um, the next parts of Swift. I want to go, go now is a little bit going into the iOS part, where we talk a little bit about a, a certain GUI elements and what we've seen yesterday a little bit by uh, uh, by showing you what kind of like functionality is there and what kind of uh, widgets and things there. So. The most commonly used framework that you will use if you write just a typical application, let's say you create your calendar application or a bus, bus driving application, you, you want to use standard GUI elements like a table, like a button, something like that. This is also all included in UIKit. This is the framework that is, ha, consists of all these elements. And what you have in these elements, you usually have like a, a, like a, a different stack of different objects on top of each other. So as we already said in the demo before, um, the typical the back level is is some kind of a window. It's called UI window. This is the just a frame. Um, on, a, on an iPhone, it's mostly the entire frame. But for example, if you have the the split view on an on an um, 
on an iPad, you actually have two windows at the same side. So this is the frame around, which you already know from the desktop application. So this is the outer layer. It has some functionalities, give you the, the drawing code, but it doesn't really do a lot because it's mostly full screen. Um, on top of these um, window, which you usually have just one, you have UI views, and from them you have a lot. And UI views are basically the different canvases that you can use for, for displaying different information. So for example, if you have an application, let's take the calendar one where you have the list of your contacts. This is one view with a table, and if you go click on the person, you go into like a, like a property information about this person. This is then another view. So what you do is you basically divide your applications in very in a lot of different um, views. So every, for everything that you do, you have these views. So every time you do these swipe movements so that the screen swipes, you basically change the view. And, and you create a lot of different views. And um, so for example, if you have like, this is the, the watch application, um, you have the assembly view where you see, oh, this is the wrong way around, but you have, the first view is for example, the navigation view here where you have the upper functionality where you have the plus and the minus thing, and then you have a di an, an additional view which presents the tables of your different clocks, and then you have maybe some custom view on top of these things. So you, what you do, you stack a lot of views on top of each other, or you have them side by side where you navigate through these different views. Um, and views can be, can be basically anything you see. So view can be just a canvas, a white canvas, but it, everything else is also subclass of view. For example, a label is a view, a button is a view. Uh, an image view is obviously a view, a scroll view is, uh, is a view. So anything that is kind of visual displayed in your interface, which Philip showed you, which you can drag into your, your storyboard is basically a view. And here are just uh, some examples. So views, uh, this tab bar controller, this navigation, this table view, a label, a UI toolbar, these are all views that you constantly use all the time. Um, there are also these, these controllers, which you will include like buttons, sliders, uh, pickers, UI segments, UI text fields. These are also basically subclasses of views with certain functionality that you can use. And these are all standard operations. So you can go into the Xcode and press this new button there, and then you can just drag, drop them in, and they already have some kind of functionality you can use. So you can, for example, as Philip showed you yesterday, how to use a button to switch to a different view in a simple way by using these things. Um, so this is the visual concept that you can just drag and drop using in a storyboard environment. But you can actually do a little bit more with that. You can actually say, oh, um, I want to have some certain functionality, which is not that common. So common is basically clicking something. But I, I want to have uh, some kind of gestures. Let's say um, um, I want to have the tap gesture. I want to have some pinching operation. And you can drag and drop them in the same way on your screen. So basically, it gives you a handle that allows you to have all of these standard um, things in a way you don't have to implement them by yourself. So for example, I want to have this, this, this green edge pen gesture, which should exactly work as an all across iOS. Don't start implementing these things on your own, because it will behave differently. So use the things and just drag and drop them in there. And what you basically do you then have a handle like a button. So you define an IB action, and then it, the action is triggered as soon as this gesture is um, yeah, executed. However, you have to decide here, there are some gestures which have just a Boolean trigger. So for example, uh, um, I think uh, a long press gesture has just the state of not on and on. So you have just one call of that function. But for example, the pinch gesture is a continuous gesture. So it constantly fires events. For example, if you zoom into a map, it will constantly give you information about the certain gestures so you can adapt on time with that and you actually don't have to trigger or have a uh, um, timer running that allows you to do that. So this is already excluded, included. In. You can also, if you want to do them, um, you could also add them by code. So there are classes that you can trigger. So basically, also, all the things that you can drag and drop and you can also do by code yourself if you want to do that. Some people do that because it's a little bit more programming style, but you can actually say, I create a LED, which is a UI button, and I add it to my um, view, and it should be placed on these things. So everything that we, we will do here in the Interface Builder, you can do in code if you like to do that. Sometimes 
this is more helpful when you have a very complex structure in this case. So gesture recognizers. Um, these are the gesture recognizers for the typical input, but you can also define your own gesture. Let's say you want to define for your game a gesture where people have to constantly draw L's or whatever. And you can always, in an in event, you can always overwrite these three functions. Uh, basically, that gives you um, these certain, the, the touch of a certain state. So touch begin is basically the, the moment when you, when you hit the surface with your finger. So this event is just called once for one touch. Then you have touch is moved. So every time you move your finger, like by a fraction of a millimeter, it will call this very, very often in 60 hertz. So you will get the touch move very, very often. And you can then say, OK, touch end um, has then, is then the final step where the touch was released. So these states are just occurring once, and these states occur multiple times. However, you don't get um, what happens is the system does not call you for every touch. It uh, collects the information and calls you just once every update cycle. So a touch begin, if you really are really good, and if you can touch the screen with both fingers exact at the same time, uh, this is not just one touch, but this is just a set. So you would get both touches at the same time. And the event would have the same uh, time frame. And if you look at the events for touch moved, which is roughly, so you can actually see how fast this thing updates. It's roughly 60 milliseconds, so roughly 60 hertz by updating these things. Um, so with this, you can actually define, create your own gesture recognizer or your own game environment if these are not enough for you, if you want to create some kind of specific user interface. So um, with this, uh, I want to stop here because I want to finish up the groups for today. So, um, and I will show the slides for the groups again. Uh, so if you have any questions about the seminars. And next week, we will continue um, with doing Swift. I will talk first uh, on Monday. I will talk about the seminar. So we'll give us a demo presentation for SpriteKit and give you a little bit of insight about SpriteKit, how to do that. And then we will continue on with Swift. And then we will also go at some point in ARKit, I guess doing that next week. We will figure it out. Yeah. All right. Then thank you for attending. This content was provided by RWTH Aachen University.